and you've even run TV commercials uh, explaining <laughs> the program and explaining yeah. the program. That's a very unique thing, by the way. Yeah. How many of you have seen t TV commercials in your jurisdictions on some new innovative government program? Private partnership laws allow projects across a broad swath of infrastructure classes here, uh, including toll roads, schools, uh, energy, wastewater, water, solid waste, ports, information technology, and more. And what's unique about it is most states have started in the transportation sector and stayed there for a long time and haven't branched out yet beyond that into other sectors of, uh, of infrastructure. And Puerto Rico's already launched its program with a much more broad scope. Um, it also established something called the Public-Private Partnership Authority. And that's a, a new center of excellence uh, within the, the, the government here to evaluate and select these public-private partnership infrastructure projects and to monitor and enforce the, the terms of those contracts. And in just two short years since they've uh, been in operation, the authority, I would say, has built a world-class uh, program and has already seen some major successes, and we're going to talk about some of those today. Um, just for quick examples as an intro, uh, to, moder to help modernize K-12 uh, school facilities and improve their academic performance, uh, the, the PPP Authority in Puerto Rico has launched the Schools for the 21st Century Initiative, under which Puerto Rico is uh, modernizing and working with private contractors to modernize, uh, design, build, and maintain approximately 100 schools across Puerto Rico. Um, uh, they've also, in earlier, uh, or excuse me, in June of last year, they selected the winning bidder for a 40-year, over a billion-dollar concession for, for two of their toll road facilities. Uh, they've also launched a procurement more recently for a long-term lease of the San Juan International Airport, uh, which most of you probably flew into. And um, last week, the authority announced that it's going to begin seeking private partners to finance, build, and maintain a new 600-bed juvenile treatment center. Um, now, those of us interested in advancing free minds and free markets, we often lament that there are often uh, many more ideas for government reform than public officials actually implementing them. So it's really always an enriching and reaffirming experience uh, to discover innovative leaders proactively taking market-based solutions uh, from concept to implementation. Uh, so we are thrilled to have one of those leaders with us today, someone who's been very critical to Puerto Rico's success in building their infrastructure program uh, into what has become a world-class infrastructure program. So without further ado, it's my honor and privilege to introduce you to our special guest for this session, David Alvarez. Uh, David Alvarez is... Thank you. Thank you, Len. Thank you, everyone. Uh, just uh, to, to, by way of introduction, uh, David is the executive director of the Puerto Rico Public-Private Partnerships Authority. Uh, he runs the program that, uh, that I just described. Uh, prior to his appointment at the authority, he served as senior advisor and special aide to the chairman and president of the Government Development Bank for Puerto Rico and as chief analyst at Santander Securities and Santander Bancorp Puerto Rico. He has a Master of Science in Urban and Regional Planning from Florida State and a bachelor's degree in economics from West Virginia University. Uh, so please join me in welcoming David. Thank you once again. So, thank you. Thank you, David. So as I've described, over the last two years, Puerto Rico has, has significantly shifted its approach to infrastructure development by embracing public-private partnerships uh, as a major component of your, your strategy uh, to fill your funding gap and to, to solve some of your problems. Can you describe the fiscal and economic factors that led to the development of your public-private partnership? Program? Sure. Um, let me start by, again, expressing my gratitude for the invitation. I think this is very exciting to be here with you. Just sharing our experience. I think we have, uh, under the leadership of our governor, we have made substantial progress in renovating uh, infrastructure in Puerto Rico and the idea that there's a role for the private sector in infrastructure that at the end of the day what we're looking for is to bring fresh capital for infr fresh investment into the economy, create jobs, and uh, look for innovation in the delivery of public services. Uh, in many of the infrastructure. Uh, a lot of this, all this has started with, uh, obviously with a clear need to, to uh, bring this about. And let me just tell you what the, the background is. Uh, just responding to your, to your question, uh, Len, uh, this is the rate of investment that we were having in, the, in infrastructure in Puerto Rico. What, we, what you're seeing here is a 10 years of history of the percentage of our GDP dedicated to infrastructure. Um, and obviously in the decade of the between 1990s and 2000, that went very well. We were investing around 4% of our GDP in infrastructure. 
Um, and one, uh, one element that contributed to, to having such a high level of just a normal level of investment in infrastructure uh, was that it was complemented, public investment in infrastructure was complemented with private participation. Uh, in the decade between the 1990s and the 2000s, we have a couple of uh, co-generators of electricity funded, fully funded by infrastructure, private persons, actually. Uh, and private investment was uh, complementing the entire public effort and investment without crowding it, uh, without replacing it, but just providing an additional uh, flux of investment. Everything was abandoned after the 2000, and this is what you have, and this is uh, from 4%, we're back in, to, in 2009, we're experiencing just 1.6%, uh, which is half of what nations and what the U.S. is actually investing in infrastructure, in, in general terms, a healthy or at least the minimal level of investment in infrastructure should be around 3% or 3.5% of GDP. Uh, and this is what we have. So this uh, coincided when you have such a high level of inv investment infrastructure, we were growing at a 3% in real terms of the economy. Now we were contracting uh, 4%. Uh, so we had a very deep recession, obviously, that coincided with this level of investment. So one of the reasons that we wanted to make sure that we bring uh, private capital to infrastructure is to restore this level of investment in infrastructure. We were uh, <clears throat> suffering from this decline. Let me just show you another slide. Or that, yeah. So, just to one of the reasons that uh, again was such a level of low infrastructure that uh, public public government cannot needed to look for partners, uh, private partners is obviously that we were facing a tremendous deficit. We inherited a deficit that was 44% of our government revenues. And here you can see it, I mean, it's very clear. The revenues of the government, when we came in, they were, uh, of the general fund, which is the budget of the central government, were around $7.6 .6 billion, but the government was actually spending $3.3 .3 billion on top of that. So there was no way that we were uh, gonna restore investment and infrastructure with this high level of deficit. We experienced one of the highest, if not the highest deficit in the, in the nation. And it was a very limiting factor. We needed to go out and look for private investment. There was no other, other choice. So the general approach uh, for us in terms of PPPs, the way we see this and we approach it is that um, we look at infrastructure and that uh, in a different way that you have different tools. There's a toolbox for investing in infrastructure. Obviously, you have your typical things. Uh, uh, a government has your, their typical things, their uh, public bonds, their tax, uh, taxation. We just included a new tool for doing that, which is public-private partnership, which is a systematic way of bringing private investment into public infrastructure. And uh, we did legislation for that. We approved legislation in 2009. And the, that established uh, a clear policy framework in which we will promote investment, a private investment or private participation in public infrastructure uh, across all infrastructure. We can do toll roads, we can do schools, we can do airports, ports, different things, even waste management facilities, uh, elderly housing. We can do a lot of things, correctional facilities. Uh, as long as they are uh, conducted under the legislation on the very transparent uh, basis in a very systematic way. So also the legislation created the, the Public Private Partnerships Authority, which is the, the entity that I, that I lead, and which has allowed us to create a consolidated framework and having consistency ac across all infrastructure projects. So this is kind of the, the background in which we created all the, all the projects that we have done and all the efforts, and it's been very successful to now. Okay. So one of the interesting aspects of your program is that you do have a centralized structure for decision making. Uh, you have this PPP authority, who is the, I call it a center of excellence, but it's, you're really the driver um, for the entire Puerto Rico government, 
for PPP projects. And that's a pretty unique approach, I mean, in the US at least. Around the world, that's a very common approach for delivering privately financed infrastructure. Um, but in the US, we, we, that's, one of the that's one of the best practices that Adrian and Bob and I are constantly talking about uh, to policymakers in the US, which is you actually can get more of these types of projects done if you have a vehicle that is set up to, to do that, right? As opposed to giving existing agencies uh, the responsibility of figuring out how to use a new and complex tool. So can we just uh, switch gears for a second and to talk about the authority and the work that you do. Um, you know, can you describe the role of the PPP authority more, you know, more, in more depth? Uh, and w what benefits have you seen from having that centralized approach as opposed to having individual agencies out there trying to, to pursue these projects without experience doing it themselves? Sure. I, I think that... Um you described it cor correctly. Uh, we are a center of excellence. One of the most important things is having consistency across all the projects. Um, when you have different government agencies trying to run different procurement processes, uh, it just becomes overextended. Uh, all the different agencies have different approaches to different projects. Uh, investors start running around going through one, two, three, four, five different agencies just for one project. They don't know, they, they find their, themselves lost. Uh, I mean, and it's, that's not the way to attract private investment. That's not the way we want to uh, bring fresh capital into the economy and create jobs. Uh, so it, it becomes a, a very cumbersome process, very bureaucratic, uh, very specific, uh, and very frustrating sometimes. We have consolidated all that into this agency. They had to go just to one place uh, for particular projects. We don't run all the projects. It's difficult to, uh, being a new government agency, we cannot uh, run all the sudden 100 projects. So we had taken it uh, a, a one, one project at a time type of approach. So uh, at the same time, you have consistency across, transparency. We, are, uh, we use our website in a great deal. Uh, and again, when you go back to the traditional model, not all the government agencies are transparent in the very same degree. They, they vary. Some of them are not transparent at all. Some are just slightly transparent in their processes. So we have contributed to consolidating the processes, um, being more transparent, even communicating to the public more, effect more effectively. That, that has gone a, a long way. We just uh, do it. We come uh, with the the OT secretary will put together a round table and just one message, one project. So it's very organized and that has helped a great deal in maximizing the way we do uh, projects and procurement in Puerto Rico. Well, let's talk about some of the projects. Um, this is always the fun part for me, is getting into the weeds of the actual projects. This is, where, this is where the theory and all the things that we write about in our policy shop actually come into play in real life. So this is always the fun part. Um, so let's start with your school's initiative, because I find this to be one of the more fascinating aspects. Um, most states that have, have shifted into public-private partnerships have, as I mentioned, have started with transportation. That's sort of the, the, the leading edge, so to speak, of the private infrastructure market. We've all heard about it. Bob has been writing about you know, that kind of model for years and years, and it's happening out there all over the place. What's now emerging are the, is the use of that same type of tool elsewhere. And I've always thought that K-12 schools would be a perfect application for the public-private partnerships. They're always out of money in the facilities. You know, I mean, it's a great, uh, there's a lot of opportunity there, I think, that when when the education establishment figures out that this finance tool is out there, I think we'll start to see more of it. And I think once you start to see projects like this one, we'll see more of it. So can you, can you talk about the Schools for the 21st Century Initiative? Tell us where you were, where you're starting from, what the goals were, and how, you, how you're getting there. Sure. Uh, this is one of the first projects that we generated under the uh, P3 Authority, uh, that's the way we call it. Uh, actually, we started from <clears throat> for a very clear need for investment. What you can see here is samples of six different public schools in Puerto Rico. By the way, we have a very extended, large uh, public school system in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico has uh, 1,400, uh, over 1,400 schools, uh, and we have schools of all sizes and shapes. It's incredible. Uh, we have even schools that are uh, from 300 students uh, all the way to 1,000 students. We even have schools that have 25 students. I mean, 
it is the clear example of government being overextended uh, because we build schools for every community. So the maintenance of the infrastructure is a real challenge in Puerto Rico and government funds with the deficit that we have and the scar scarce, uh, scarcity of resources, obviously maintenance is something that is being very uh, a, a big challenge for government. So this is some of the conditions of the infrastructure that you can see in some of these schools. I mean, the, all these schools that you're seeing here were selected to be modernized uh, and obviously modernized with the uh, collaboration of the private sector. We'll tell you a little bit more uh, about each, but you can, you, we, we were, uh, we, we look for even examples where the students were put at risk with uh, conditions that were not in a tropical uh, a climate like Puerto Rico, having outside for, outdoor furniture doesn't work. It just, uh, it, sh it shouldn't happen, right? The students should be able to go out and have fun, play, and, and do some learning activities. So there, there are all kinds of, so there was a clear need for investment in public schools. This is what we did. Um, we, uh, the government looked for ways to finance uh, better uh, modernization of, of existing public schools. We did not want to uh, rebuild or build new schools, really. We wanted to take care of this actual stock of schools. We, need, we do not need more schools. We need better schools. So we team up with the private sector in order to put together a program, which is private sector will design, build, and do the maintenance of the school. Uh, the funding was uh, a public source funding that was very, very uh, favorable in terms of cost. It was very cheap capital. So we decided to put some public funds together with innovation in construction, design, and maintenance of the private sector. And we've created a platform there where we're going to deliver faster and deliver savings for the government and we'll transform 100 public schools. And the, all this created very wide support for public private partnerships. This is the first time in Puerto Rico that we uh, take a, a serious step in integrating the private sector into the infrastructure of the uh, education system. Before, uh, all these steps, besides uh, being publicly financed, all these steps were, were government steps. So traditional procurement will do, government will do the whole design. You actually will do 100% design. The school will have to be designed fully um, before you actually build it, and then a maintenance will be also government. In this, in this 100 schools, all this is transferred to the public, to the private sector, and the results are are uh, incredible. I mean, it has allowed for faster delivery of modernization of schools. Jobs are being created, and investment is happening in schools. Obviously, we went through all the um, through all the headaches of moving uh, students to other schools and all that, but people are getting involved, their jobs are being created, and investment is, is quickly moving into the economy to different schools in different municipalities across Puerto Rico. So a very interesting project that uh, is, is having a, a substantial impact in the economy, and this is what we want, private investment. Uh, partnering with the private sector to uh, create and faster deliver better, better projects and create jobs. Okay. So now let's move on to the next project, the, the second PPP project that you had in your toll roads. And last year you, you finalized a 40-year billion dollar lease of the PR22 and PR5 toll roads. Uh, can you tell us about this initiative and what prompted it and what improvements you expect? Sure. Similar to, uh, similar but different approach. This, this one is fully financed. This is a picture of the toll road that we call PR22. It's the largest and the busiest toll road in Puerto Rico. Actually, this, is, this here is the largest toll plaza in Puerto Rico. Uh, very, very congested. Uh, a need of a lot of public work, public investment. Uh, and very difficult to maintain under the fiscal constraints that we had. So we decided to team up with the, part, with the private sector in which we will do a long-term lease of the, of the toll road uh, and a private sector will come and do all the investments, all the improvements and operate the toll road for a 40-year term. Um, here, again, uh, just a sample of the conditions that we were facing. Uh, 
you, you have even from safety conditions in which uh, the electric the electrical system of some of the highway uh, was not functioning correctly even the guardrails were not in good shape uh, so those are safety con pavement conditions uh, you can see how we needed to restore investment here so we did a procurement uh, process a PPP procurement in which uh, we invited the private sector to come and do a, a payment for the rights and for operating the toll road for 40 year concession, the toll road revenue will flow to the private sector and they would do, um, and they would do a great program of public improvements that would deal with congestion and still the government will monitor the uh, compliance of operating standards for the toll road. So this way, uh, September of last year, we closed a deal after the procurement in which uh, a consortium composed by Goldman Sachs and a Spanish toll road operator uh, whose name is Albertis, they won the procurement for actually uh, maintaining and operating PR22 together with PR5, which is a smaller toll road here with just one toll plaza. There are seven toll plazas ac across this uh, toll road here, which is the one you saw in the pictures. It's a 40-year concession, it's a long-term lease. Uh, it was successfully closed, very good. Uh, there now, you travel the, the toll road, now you can see people working, doing the landscaping, improvements in the lighting and all that, so people are seeing already the difference of private participation and investment uh, in public infrastructure, something that the state just did not have, the government did not have the resources to conduct in a very uh, fast and diligent way. And just a, as an aside, if you did not have the PPP approach for this project, how long would it have taken in government to oh, get Oh, no, this there, there, were no, there were no resources in the, uh, the Highway and Transportation Authority to do this. Uh, there was, besides ha not having the resources to do, the investment needed to restore uh, pavement conditions, which are better for drivers, or even safety conditions. There was no uh, resources to do that. Even uh, they were confronting problems with uh, managing correctly the toll plazas where we were experiencing uh, revenue leakage. Uh, I mean, they were not actually, there was, there was a, an estimated amount of revenue leakage uh, there. So, I mean, not only the physical improvements, also the operational administrative managerial part was not, was not as, at the standards that we wanted to. So, I mean, we put it all there, all in the contract. We were, were very clear in making sure we wanted to uh, require world-class uh, operating standards for the toll roads. And now the Transportation Authority, what they do is just manage that that is being in compliance to, and is being, is, is working very nicely so far, yes. So no, a lot of time, a lot of resources that we did not have, we were not gonna expect to have a world-class infrastructure that we gonna have very soon. Uh, it will take very, very long if we, we are going to ever to experience that. Very long if yeah, ever, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. okay, so let's shift to the third, uh, the third PPP project. Uh, you're actively currently pursuing a long-term concession for the San Juan Airport. So tell us about the goals there and what you're trying to achieve. Sure, very similar to the toll road. Uh, you all been here. This is the largest airport in the Caribbean, um, and it has the largest market share of seats of travelers into the Caribbean region. Um, again, uh, there's, there's need for investment here. Uh, it's being managed by the Ports Authority, uh, who has a very uh, deteriorated credit profile at this point. They, they, they cannot even issue bonds anymore. They're not in the public markets. Uh, and the infrastructure is, has deteriorated some. This is uh, just the samples. Even safety conditions are not the best. Uh, and obviously accommodation for passengers that had to wait in, in gates or wait to pick up, uh, being picked up by, f uh, f uh, by family or friends are not the best. We want to change that and we want to take an approach in which a private sector will come in, private investor will come in and operate the airport, uh, improve and, and conduct a series of capital investments and just apply world-class uh, standards and practices to a better uh, airport. We believe that, uh, I mean, we have it, 
we've been running it for many years, and it is, it is, we have what we have right now, but definitely being the largest airport in the Caribbean, we want to have and deliver a better experience for the traveler. So for us, this is not just um, a financial transaction, it's, a, it's an economic measure, really. We want to improve and the infrastructure and bring more passengers to Puerto Rico. This is crucial being an island. Uh, you want to make sure that not, not only passengers and individuals can come in with ease into in and out uh, for pleasure or for business into Puerto Rico, but also the international trade. Uh, a lot of the 46% of our international trade is by air, and 90% of that is handled at this airport. So we want to make sure that the cargo business is well run. So right now we're about uh, in the final phase of, of having uh, a procurement process for this in which the private sector will take the risk of financing, operating, and maintenance, and improvement, and improving the airport. Uh, a major undertaking, I think, is will be the first uh, U.S. PPP airport in the U.S. Uh, we're very excited about uh, improving this in a long-term basis and delivering a better experience for passengers. This is what we're working on. Uh, I'm fully dedicating like 90% of my time just to this now. Uh, but we're in the final phase of this, and, and it will be a great experience to show to the rest of the nation that uh, airports also can benefit from private investment and well-run and world-class uh, standards. And it will, we're fascinated by the fact that uh, having more passengers into Puerto Rico will be a great thing for economic development. And again, a driver of positive change, creating jobs and better uh, trade uh, with with the with other parts of the world, so that's that's the general intent there. Okay. And so, what else is coming in the pipeline? What's next? Sure, we are. Uh, we have. We're uh, very busy. Have a pipeline of working with other, like you mentioned. We just launched a private uh, a project for the private sector to design, build, finance, and maintain a juvenile uh, correctional facility. Uh, we believe that. Uh, again, the infrastructure part uh, can be handled better by the private sector. Uh, a lot of innovation can be achieved uh, uh, there in the correctional facility. We have also other transportation projects. We're looking at uh, new greenfield uh, extensions of the highway system, uh, which are, we're not even considering issuing bonds or public debt for that, or uh, wasting, or not wasting, but having any tech tax money into transportation that can be w well run and paid by users and financed by private sector. So that's more, more transportation, correctional facilities, probably more schools and finishing the airport. That's what we have in the next uh, eight months for us in the Petri Authority in Puerto Rico. Okay. And what would you say makes Puerto Rico an attractive place for investment? I think that uh, obviously the approach that we have taken has gone a long way in providing comfort to uh, the private sector. Uh, we're being transparent. Uh, we've been very rigorous in the projects. We don't launch a project until we study it, research it, and understand and prepare ourselves to go out uh, to make sure that the private sector is not wasting time or resources in getting into a procurement that is not well thought out. Uh, so we're dedicating a lot of effort to that. Also, uh, we are we are a U.S. territory. Uh, we have uh, we are a, Ju a U.S. jurisdiction with all uh, the uh, judicial system of the U.S. Obviously, a banking system that is regulated by by all the federal government agencies, and all that that provides also additional comfort. Uh, but I think the approach and the, uh, the fact that Puerto Rico is a vibrant economy, is the largest economy in the Caribbean, uh, we have a very strong consumer sector, a very strong manufacturing sector, all those, act, all those things combined make us an interesting uh, investment destination for the private sector. Okay. So with that, I would like to open up the, well first, can we give a hand to David Alvarez, please? Thank you. All right, now I'd like to open it up to questions. Okay, wait till I get to oh. you with the, oh, can you turn this one on? Okay. Hi, see, uh, so obviously the private sector is way better at operating most of the public assets. 
Uh, and I, and all these, did you say a thousand schools? I said uh, four, yeah, it's uh, uh, 1,400 schools. So there's 1,400 schools, and, 1400, I, and yes. I see that they're involved in the infrastructure. When are you gonna dump all 1,400 over to someone to run them? Yeah, correct. That's, that's, the, sec that's the question that we have. Uh, the 20, the, the schools for the, actually the schools for the 20, 21st century um, is being uh, run, and the governor lost this project. I mean, even the communities, I, they, they, they are uh, very uh, excited about the opportunity of being extended to other schools. Um, we are working now on extending that to more than 100 schools, uh, adding a, another set of 100 schools maybe into the program. So we go little by little to make sure that, uh, that we extend the, the program to the, to the rest of the schools. Again, a lot of the schools in Puerto Rico were built in a different decade for a different purpose. Uh, population was growing at a faster rate. Uh, so probably we, right now, there's a lot of stock of schools that probably won't, won't be needed in the future. So there's also an exercise that we had to do of consolidating schools. So now we're just focusing on having, rather than having the quantity of schools being spread around, is more the quality of schools. So we're probably gonna have a second round of, of schools for the 21st century program together with some consolidation that makes sense in reducing the number of schools. I'm not talking about infrastructure, I'm talking about operating, I'm getting rid of the uh, Yeah, that's, that's, that's another, uh, another whole set of uh, big question in Puerto Rico. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll get to that point soon. Uh, this, it is on our agenda. Obviously, it is it is contemplated in our P3 legislation, and uh, I think this was a very first important first step. People will see the difference. They see that private sector can make a difference in the educational system, uh, and that has been very welcome. So hopefully, this will help us get there. In many parts of the United States, uh, privatization and public-private partnerships uh, tend to be politically controversial. Uh, your program now is, is you know, up and running for several years. What's been the political reaction, the reaction of media? Uh, is it a controversial issue, or so far are you having mostly good support from the public and, and from legislators and so forth? It is a controversial issue. Um, so far, uh, I think that there's a recognition that, that the government has a, has a chronic deficit, uh, that there's need to think of out of the box, let's say, and look for alternatives. So there's a level of recognition there. Uh, people will accept it as long as they, uh, they understand it. Um, the public schools was one where we debated a long time because people were thinking that we were just selling the schools or something. We explained that the private sector was just, at this point, building and doing infrastructure. Uh, and we even went to the communities and, and presented, this is your school now, this is how it's gonna look. Uh, we have an entire team that, that goes to the communities and have kind of grassroots uh, meetings. So explaining goes a long way. In the toll roads, uh, what we did is the same thing that we're gonna do in the airport. We're gonna make sure that the private sector delivers a difference early in the process. Um, making sure that people will start seeing the difference within months of awarding the deal is important uh, because they, they want to see things different, they want to see things that are improving, and that has gone a long way in terms of the toll roads deal. For the airport, we're doing the same approach. I mean, in the, in the toll roads uh, transaction, the private sector has to invest uh, $75 million in the first three years of the concession. So it's very upfront loaded. Uh, and the airport will be the same approach. That ap approach uh, has gone a long way for us. Controversies are there, questions, uh, they, people ask questions. We have, uh, together with our approach, we have not been shy and go out and being open about it and say, listen, this is what we're doing because we believe in this and we're gonna create jobs this way too. And you've even run TV commercials uh, explaining <laughs> the program and explaining yeah. the program. That's a very unique thing, by the way. Yeah. How many of you have seen t TV commercials in your jurisdictions on some new innovative government program? You know, these guys are out there actually trying to actively communicate. Not only are they doing the implementation of the projects, but you're trying to communicate it in a, in a very innovative way that I've not seen anywhere else in the U.S. Yeah, we had dedicated efforts in, in even doing TV commercials. I mean, we, for the schools, I think we put together like three different TV commercials. For the toll roads, uh, we put together four 
TV, four TV commercials that were different and they run for some time. The airport, uh, we had TV commercials running up to the 31st of December last year. Uh, so yeah, we're not, we're going out and explaining what we really want. And the, what we really want is economic development. Uh, again, positive change. And so far, it's been, it's, it's been uh, well received. So uh, obviously, every project is, is unique. Uh, the airport might be seen different. The correctional facility might be seen different. But we even run focus groups on, on this, uh, on every project, see how the perception of people are. And, and we try to tackle that and put a, a communication strategy around that as a function of that. So that's important. Okay. Thank you. Back here. A couple of questions, if I may. Uh, you, you had mentioned that the, um, one of the byproducts, one of the pleasant by byproducts is the creation of jobs. But of course, there's also a loss of jobs. There's a transfer of workers uh, from public workers to private workers. And I would think one of the goals would be a net loss of jobs because you can probably have fewer workers working more efficiently. So what if you can speak to what happens to the public workers who are no longer doing the job, their job being replaced by private workers. And a totally separate question, on the toll roads, uh, there's an issue, it seems to me, that on these 40-year toll road concessions, there's a risk that the concessionaire defaults and doesn't perform their job. And I was just curious, very briefly, I could eat too much in the weeds, what kind of financial controls do you have so that to protect yourself against the financial downside of an operator who discovers they bid too low and they're losing money and they walk from the job? Sure, uh, on the jobs question, that's a very, that's a very important question. I mean, uh, one of the reasons we are doing this is because we want the private sector to grow. Um, we have taken an, an approach in which uh, we analyze in detail the number of, job, of public, uh, public officials and public jobs that are uh, kept by or are uh, dedicated to each of these infrastructures. Um, we have uh, the ability to provide an opportunity really to public, uh, to public workers and we tell them that they can go to the private sector or they can stay within the public sector. Uh, that has uh, gone a long way also in allowing uh, more uh, well receive all the projects. Uh, the reality is that people, uh, a lot of people tend to go to the private sector. So uh, you either uh, have some public uh, officials going to the private sector and uh, some others decide to stay uh, and the ones that, you, that decide to stay, we have relocated them in other in other toll roads or in other parts, uh, in other in other type of jobs and things like that. But we we keep them. Uh, some others uh, have uh, have gone and take advantage of different retirement windows that we have opened simultaneously uh, with this. So. The private concessionaires have taken the public employees, and actually they want to recruit the, private, the public employees, really, um, and have created, if not all, all the public employees have transferred, they have created additional jobs into, into the, uh, to make, make sure that they cover the difference. Now, a lot of the new incremental jobs happen when you require new investment in the, in the capital improvements. Uh, I mean, jobs in construction, jobs in improving uh, the, tor the, the pavements, uh, uh, doing all kinds of things. Those are newly created uh, jobs into the economy that a lot of them work as a stimulus, immediate stimulus for the economy, which helps you again to, to jumpstart the economy and, and get things moving. So yes, it's a complicated uh, equation. Uh, some uh, public jobs will ret be retained in the government but definitely the ones that are uh, dedicated to uh, the capital improvements, that's all incremental new jobs into the economy. Uh, and these companies, they would maximize the public infrastructure. They actually, the toll roads uh, operator wants more traffic, so they will tend to do more improvements along the life of the concession, and that will be all private sector new jobs. So that's the approach that we're, that we're taking there. Um, in, into into that. 
The other question uh, was, I want to make sure I remember the, the, the other question was the one related to, uh, was it the approach of the? the, default, the how do you protect yourself against? Default? Yeah, okay, the default. Um, you're right, I mean, the, the public interest has to be protected. One particular item before, uh, before going into more into the detail, the public-private partnership uh, model of delivering infrastructure has an operator of the infrastructure. Investors will come in pairs. They will come as a team. And usually you get an operator of the infrastructure, of the infrastructure and a financial partner. Um, if the operator is having troubles financially, the financial partner would not put the concession at risk, would not put the contract at risk, and probably they will take action before they go into default. They will replace the operator with somebody else, even the lenders of the concessionaire. So the, system, the contract, the model itself is robust in that sense. Um, we, have, we have the right, this, the government has the right, reserves the right to replace the operator. Uh, and actually uh, strike a deal with the lenders or the financial partners uh, if the operator is about to go default, uh, because that's something that you want to avoid. So we're fully protected that we have reserved all the rights, contractually contra contra speaking, we have reserved all the rights to replace any financiers or any of the operators in case of default. Um, how far or do you have a roadmap for future projects and uh, how, f how many projects and how far into the future does it go? We have a pipeline of projects that uh, right now we are we're running two procurements uh, of the airport, which is in the final phase of the procurement process. And we have this new facility correction, a juvenile facility that we, we just launched that is going to be a 2012 project. Uh, after that, we're going to concentrate back in transportation with some new greenfield, new construction projects uh, of certain highways, including PR22, the one that you saw is not it does not cross as the north of Puerto Rico fully. There's an extension that we want to complete. Um, we have a pipeline of, of between uh, two and five projects, additional projects that we want to launch. So it goes well into 2016 right now at this point. Um, and again, we're taking one project at a time. We want to make sure that at the beginning of the program, we got it right. Uh, we were not trying to do all projects at once. Uh, so it's important that from the schools we learn, we're applying things. From the toll roads we learn, we're applying things for the future. And the toll roads, again, I mean, into, in the pipeline, again, it goes well into, again, next three or four years of new projects coming into the pipeline based on a lot of the experience that we have built early in the process. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Thank you all. <laughs>